This is Rob Phelan, and this is the Earn and Invest Podcast. Two stories well known in the personal finance world about kids and money. One, Jail Collins, writer on investing and financial independence, started his blog and eventually book to record his thoughts for his young adult daughter, Jessica, who had no interest in hearing about them at the time. Two, Diana Miriam chose to hold her annual conference, Economy, at the University of Cincinnati in hopes that never came to fruition that students were interested in learning about personal finance. Although year one was a smashing success and year two most assuredly will be, very few students are slated to attend. These examples lead us to believe that when it comes to kids and money, it appears that garnering their interest is indeed difficult. Maybe, just maybe, we're not starting early enough. Rob Phelan is a father of a two-year-old Declan, husband, and an advocate for personal finance education. He is also a high school math and personal finance teacher in Maryland. His book, M is for Money, which was created to help young children become confident and responsible money managers, is available for pre-order now and officially launches on November 13th. Rob Phelan, welcome back to Earn and Invest. It's great to have you back. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I love the introduction. You said I'm like dad to a two-year-old Declan. I'm like, that's a great way to describe him. Like he's just his own little like monster child, amazing person. So yeah, he's definitely in his own category. Well, and it's interesting, you know, having kids changes you and this was your first child. Tell me about writing this book. Did your son inspire you to set off on this project? Absolutely. Yeah. I think the last time we talked, so thank you for having me back on first off. I think I was the first guest after you changed the name of your podcast, Earn and Invest, because I remember I was practicing like, no, we got to say something totally different. He totally inspired this. Seeing him grow up, he was getting into that late one, early two age and was really starting to show a lot of curiosity about the world, understanding kind of some of the systems that were in place. Like he wants, he loves going to the grocery store loves sitting in the cart, loves helping us put things in the cart, take them out of the cart. He wants to help pay for things. So basically he wants to take the cart and swipe it. He loves doing that. And I was like, okay, you, you, you're showing an interest in learning more about this. And I want to find a book that, you know, cause he loves to read. And I want to find a book that would just introduce some basic money concepts and in a playful, fun way. And there just wasn't much out there. There's very little out there that targets that young an age group. There's plenty out there for adults. like We know the adult market is full of books about self-help and personal finance. Late teens, we can find some. Middle school, a few less, not many. And then elementary school, there is not much out there at all. There's a couple of stories where money might make an appearance in the book, but it's not the central theme. So I wanted to create something that was meant for three to eight-year-olds, that first age group that should be starting to learn about money. And yeah, my son was definitely a driving force behind that. Yeah, let's talk about that first age group. You define that as three to eight. And I remember having Doug Nordman on the military finance, uh, financial independence guy. And I asked him the same question. Is it ever too early to teach your kids about money? And he said, pretty much, you know, when it's time to start teaching them when they stop trying to eat it. And I'll ask you the same question. Is it ever too early to start? I don't think so. And my son is still like, you can't trust him with coins. So he's already still not in that age group of, I can trust him to like handle coins safely and not put them in his mouth. We like, will identify them from books where there's good examples of like quarters, nickels, dimes, and so on. But yeah, you can't trust him to handle coins yet. As soon as they start showing an interest in what you as an adult do, which is pretty much as soon as they can start walking and talking, like they start kind of trying to replicate what you're doing. They want to replay what happens in their day-to-day life with their toys, with the stuffed animals, um, with you as well. And you can use those opportunities to start having money conversations and even just kind of guiding their play as to like, this is how a true money situation would work. So like, for example, my son loves to push his little grocery shopping cart around and will place like his play food around the house and he'll go and he'll pick it up and put it in his cart. And then he stops by the cash register on the way um, to finishing and he wants to like pay for it. And he'll just hand us imaginary money and we hand him back his change. And then he goes on his merry way, but just, yeah, we we play out basic concepts so that he gets the idea that you have to trade money for things that you want or need. You're a pretty financially savvy guy. You're a financial educator. Tell me about your early money conversations. I mean, do you remember doing this stuff with your parents when you were around the same ages? I think back to like the toys that I had in my house. I don't recall anything money related. Like, I don't think I grew up with like a cash register. I don't think I had like a play 
kitchen or grocery cart or any of that stuff. And I don't know if that's because my parents didn't believe in the kind of gender fluid toys that maybe we should be seeing more and more now, or if it's just, they didn't think of bringing those sorts of toys in. Maybe I didn't show that kind of interest as a kid. I'm not sure. So no, I didn't have that sort of stuff growing up. And I don't remember having formal money conversations with my parents. They did encourage me to save. I do remember that. So when I was in sixth grade, I just moved from the US back to Ireland. And a cool thing that they had there was in the elementary school, the local post office actually also operated as a bank, which is strange now that I think back to it. So the post office was a place you could deposit money and withdraw money. And they had little satellite branches in all the elementary schools. So a student or two students every month were the bankers for the month. And they would, at the start of the school day, have a little table and you could take your cash in there, deposit it. They would give you a a little like passport book that you kept track of how much money you put in and taken out. And it would get signed off by these two students. And then they would hand the money over to the teacher who would then hand it over to the post office official later in the day for deposit. And you could actually withdraw money that way too. But that was the first time I was introduced to like a formal account and saving. So I had a savings account when I was, I don't know, what, 10 years old, maybe? Is that sixth grade? So yeah, early stuff like that. And then I remember my parents telling me when I wanted something that it wasn't a no, like you can't have it unless it was dangerous, but it was more of a, you can have it, but we're not buying it for you. You're going to have to go pay for this yourself. And they gave me that opportunity at least to say like, okay, if you want something, you can go earn it. And so they did the chores that had a dollar value attached to it. So things like washing the car, mowing the grass, washing the windows, things that were a little bit above and beyond, like just keeping your room clean. Like that was just an expectation. And then also I remember collecting like bottles and cans from my neighbors and take them to like a bottle bank area that would pay you, I think it was maybe a nickel for each one. And I remember collecting my money that way to be able to buy things that I wanted. I think I saved a hundred dollars once for a Lionel train set when I was, I had to be under 10 because I was still in the U S and I have vivid memories of saving up for this thing for months, going and buying it. And then two weeks later being totally bored with it. And it was a total like learning experience for me. Your experiences are interesting, especially when you describe Ireland and how you're talking about kindergarten age kids getting involved in the banking system. In my introduction, I talked about older kids, right? Young adults, and at least two cases where it didn't seem they were as interested in money as we as educators and adults were hoping. Is there a problem if we wait too long? I mean, you're a high school finance teacher. Is there a point where if you let it go too long during childhood, the kids eventually lose interest and then don't want to be involved in such conversations? A little bit. I think the difference between teaching young kids and older people is that for older people, it's self-help for young kids. It's just developing positive attitudes, relationships, beliefs, values, habits around money. Like it's just, it's part of their whole like learning experience. And I can see like why Dan is struggling with the college students. I have the same problem with my high school kids that they don't realize there's a problem yet. And most high, most college students don't realize there's a problem until they graduate. And six months later, that first student loan, um, payment invoice comes in, you're like, oh, that's that's a lot of money. And we see that that's what's causing our student loan problem is that people are signing up for these things. They're signing on the dotted line. They don't get what they're doing. And it isn't until the negative impact of it comes in that they realize, oh, actually there's a problem. And now I need to try and fix it. So yeah, that's that's one of the struggles with the high school teaching of personal finance as well, is that you have to try and convince kids that there's something to be learned here. There's a problem that needs fixing. So the first step is actually painting the picture that there is a problem. And then we start presenting the solutions to it and how they can do better with young kids. Yeah. They just, they just want to learn everything. Like kids are full of curiosity. They want to do all the things that the adults are doing. And it's just an opportunity for parents every single day to be a good role model, to be a play partner. So someone who gets down on the floor with them and reenacts these situations and helps them play through how money works. I think we do that with our son all the time. Like we want to go to the doctor and he's got to get a shot. Like we will role play that whole scenario ahead of time. So that he knows doctor's going to come in. We'll check ears, check eyes, check breathing. And then we will probably give a shot, get a bandaid. It's all done. It's over. And we've noticed when we prep him for the situation, he is so much more willing to go through with it and understands what's going to happen. It's the same thing with money. I took him to the grocery store the other day and we, there's like the little kid size shopping carts. And I said to him, like, we're going in for, 
I think we were going in for like milk and eggs, like just two staple things that we needed. And he started pulling other things off the shelf. And I was like, no, Bob, what do we come in for? And he's like, milk and eggs. And I was like, yeah, is that milk and eggs? Nope. So he put it back, kept pushing his cart and started to get the idea that, okay, there's a plan when we go to shop and we're buying things that we need or things that we want, but that we've decided ahead of time that we actually intend to purchase those. And we don't just buy things on a whim. And he's already starting to get that idea like, oh, that that's just how money works. You don't just buy what you feel like in that moment. You have to think about it. And I think, you know, if imagine if we had all learned that lesson growing up. As you talk about role modeling, I think we here on Earn and Invest, we talk a lot about how to teach kids about money. And up to this point, in my own head, I've always put it in three separate buckets, right? There is didactic teaching, which I think very much a book about money is. There is modeling, having the kids see what we do, and then they can kind of do things by our example. And last but not least, there's experiential learning, right? Mm -hmm. Where we give them allowance and we say, okay, this lasts for a week or a month. This is all you're going to get. Go ahead and use it. And they get to play around with it. Maybe they use too much. Maybe they use too little and they learn. I have to admit that before this conversation, I often kind of said, well, didactic teaching never really did it for me. It was much more modeling and experiential learning. Tell me, am I wrong? Because I think M is for money, at least is the start of that didactic teaching that at least as a kid, I don't know if I benefited so much from. I actually think kids books, as opposed to adult books, kids books are modeling. So kids books are stories. Like we're seeing characters in books doing things and kids are looking at that as a role model. Like, oh, this is what my favorite characters are doing. And same thing with TV shows, like, and they want to model after that rather than saying like, you have to do this. So like in M is for money, you have, it's an ABC's book. So every letter has a word that goes with it. So for example, A is for allowance and you get a definition of what an allowance is. And that's more for your older kids. The younger kids won't care about the definition just yet, but then there's also an illustration and then a mini story that goes with that. So in the allowance one, you have a little girl who's receiving an allowance from her parents. And you can see that, you know, the two parents are down on their knees. They're giving the money over. So you can see that you know a kid receives money in an allowance and that's how an allowance works at a very basic level. And then there's a squirrel character, Stash the Squirrel, who's my essential character that comes in on every page and asks the kids a question. And on that page, it's what would you do with an allowance? So the parents can kind of just like pose this question out there and let the kid decide, what would I do if someone handed me some money? Where would I spend it? What would I spend it on? You know, would I save it? Would I play with it? Would I, I think Doug Norman's a fan of saying like, they'd probably light on fire and run around. Um, <laughs> I'm sure he told that story. So it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely, I think kids books are model situations as opposed to didactic, like you have to do this this way. Yeah. That's an interesting point. And I, I don't think I ever looked at it that way, but yeah, it makes sense when you're talking about young kids it's more than just words on the page. Maybe at that age, their imagination is greater. So oh, they sure. see the characters as models. Let's talk about the book itself. What, the first thing I thought when I read it is it's, yes, it's very reminiscent of kind of the Dr. Seuss books for the letters of the alphabet, right? I remember mm-hmm. um, with my kids going through those and, and, and you know, the, the, the words that rhymed, right? Little A, big A, what begins with A? Yeah, exactly. Uh, Is, was no. <laughs> that some of your inspiration? But I'd never seen anything like that that had anything to do with money. So was that some of your inspiration? I mean, I wish I could like write and rhyme that well because <laughs> <laughs> it would have been so much more like fun for kids. Kids love books that rhyme. But yeah, that kind of inspiration, the true inspiration was actually another book that I came across that a friend of ours had given my son. He was showing an interest in baking and cooking. Like he loves to be in the kitchen with us up on his like stool and getting very hands-on and dirty and all that stuff. And they gave us this book and it was A is for artichoke. So another ABC's book. And it was, again, just introducing kids to new words and banking on the idea that they're already interested in this topic. So they're, they're going to be, you're going to be able to stretch their vocabulary a little bit more in that area. And he loved it. Like it was a book again, that aged up with students. So there was just the letter recognition in the beginning and the word. So he just knows that A is for artichoke and you can see a fun little picture there. But there was also like a whole like fun fact about artichokes or where they came from. And that was more for your older kids who were looking to go back and get something else from this book. So I wanted to do something like that. I wanted a book that was great for an introduction to money. So my son at two years old can just like, he can tell you like, if I say, hey, bud, what is B for? And he'll come back, B is for bank. So he knows what the word bank is. Does he know what it means yet? Maybe, maybe not. But at least that word is kind of starting to make its way into his vocabulary. And then for older kids, 
they'll be the ones who are looking at the definitions and probably the ones giving the more thought and insight into the questions being posed by the squirrel character. So like D is for dollar. The question is, what can you buy for a dollar? And I'm sure even as adults, you'd have to probably search a little bit in your head to be like, what could I buy for a dollar or less? And getting kids to try and start identifying, like, I've got money. What can I afford to buy with that money? So I think there's so many lessons that can come in depending on the age of the student and the experience with money. So you've talked about the squirrel character a few times. His name is Stash, and he's one of the consistent characters throughout each page. Tell me how you came up with him and what role you think he plays in the book. Originally, he was a cow. He was going to be Cash the Cow. And I, th- I thought that was going to be a kind of a fun little character to have, but there was like some trademark issues. There was another Cash Cow out there. So I started playing with other characters and like words that kind of went with the character that were also money related and Stash the Squirrel and Penny the Panda were my top two. And I put it to a vote with my audience and they said Stash was the one they wanted. And I like kind of fell in love with the character as well. So I was like, yes, Stash the Squirrel. So the idea of saving ahead of time. So squirrels, you know how they work. They find the acorns, they bury them for another day, and then they come back and they reap those rewards later. And ideally, we're going to do the same thing without forgetting where 90% of them are. So yeah, I like the idea of using a squirrel as my central character to talk about money. And I know you've mentioned it, but I also want to go into a little more detail about the structure of each page. So there Mm -hmm. is the letter and the word, right? M is for money, but there's also kind of a sentence at the bottom and then a question Tell me why you went with that format. So again, just to provide something that was, I guess, multi-leveled. So every kid was going to get maybe something a little bit different out of this, depending on how old they were, how literate they were, and then their experience with money as well. For my son, it's about letter recognition. So he's learning the letters of the alphabet and then just introducing him to as many new words as possible. That's where you start. So it's just the top line, like A is for allowance, B is for bang, C is for cost, that sort of thing. And then as kids get a little bit older, we start looking at maybe the illustration and being like, okay, what's going on in the picture? So we see a kid, you know, in the grocery store pointing to a price tag and like, okay, that's the word cost. Like this, I think it's banana costs 20 cents or 30 cents. And then you've got the definition, which is probably the highest level part of the book. So what is um, the definition of cost? You're like, okay, the amount of money you'd have to exchange to buy something. And then the stash, the squirrel one is again, another question that's going to change as kids get older. I think it's a fun way for parents to get an easy entry point into talking to their kids about money. Cause you, I was trying to think like, what's the barrier for parents as to why they don't do this already. And I think some of them, it is just a lack of comfort around the topic. Maybe they don't feel like they have a very good understanding of money itself. They've had bad experience with money. Maybe they don't feel like they handle money particularly well. And I wanted to give parents or educators or caregivers this easy entry point to be like, here's a question you can ask to a kid where you don't have to volunteer much of your own information, but you can certainly engage them in a conversation and get them thinking about money. And we're trying to build thoughtfulness. We're trying to build positive habits and just a healthy relationship with money. So there's no shame, fear, guilt around the topic as they get older. I definitely want to jump into that whole sense of shame and fear and guilt. But before we do, I feel like I want to touch on some of the specific letters. You know, we we mentioned, obviously, it's called M is for money. Mm-hmm. You mentioned A for allowance, C for cost. I noticed a few that were interesting. K is for kidpreneur. Did you have <laughs> trouble finding some some words that you wanted to use? And how selective were you? Because I think that's uh, kidpreneur was a, a really interesting one. I think very important for this topic, but it wouldn't be something I'd come up with immediately. So last time I was on the podcast, I was talking about the simple startup, which is my business. So entrepreneurship is something very close to my heart. And I wanted to find a way to get this into the book. E is for earn. So we do talk about earning money, but I also wanted to get entrepreneurship in there and I couldn't have two E words. And K, yeah, K is a hard one to find like a good money word for. And when you're trying to do words in a kid's book, you're trying to really be conscious of keeping them as short as possible. And I was really trying to draw as many words as I could from kindergarten, first grade, and second grade um, common core state standards. So I was looking at the education system to see like, what are the words that kids this age group should be learning about already? And that's where I was drawing a lot of my inspiration from and then finding you know money related words as well. But yeah, kidpreneur, I kind of made up <laughs> that word, I guess. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, a kid, kids being entrepreneurs, we want them to go out and find ways to solve problems for other people, earn their own money. Uh, I I love the idea of entrepreneurship for kids, for sure. 
what was the hardest letter? I'm going to guess it was X, but uh, tell me if oh, I'm yeah. wrong. For sure, X. It's like every book is like X-ray and xylophone. You're like, well, no, <laughs> not, none, of, none of those. Fit those here. aren't money words. Yeah. Yeah. So I went with exchange, which obviously starts with E, but it has a strong X sound and trying to find words that had the, a strong sound for the letter and the appropriate sounds. You weren't trying to find weird words in the English language that don't sound anything like their starting letter. You're trying to find ones that are um, you know, appropriate for that letter. So kids are learning sound recognition as well. That was some feedback I got from a preschool teacher when she read the book. She's like, you know, I love these ones because they sound like they're supposed to, but these words don't. So I made a lot of changes to make sure that I was helping the teacher side as well. Tell us about the graphics. I, I noticed you were very, very thoughtful about the graphics. A, a few things stood out. One is inclusivity. So it seemed like you were very thoughtful about being inclusive of different kinds of people and different kinds of families. When I was looking to hire an illustrator, I created pretty much a job description of what I wanted. I had to say like, this is the style I wanted. I gave some examples from other kids' books of the, the overall art, artistic style that I wanted them to produce. I said that I needed you to be comfortable with drawing children from multiple backgrounds, nationalities, cultures, without it being like cultural appropriation. Like they needed to look like they belonged in the US. So I didn't want to stereotype people in any way, but I also wanted it to be obvious that there was inclusivity in the book and kids could find themselves in the book. So they're differentiated based on appearance, family structure, different, I guess, levels of ability. So we have kids with um, hearing aids, glasses, wheelchairs, as well as you know kids who don't have those things. We have same-sex couples. We have single-parent families. Grandparents are mentioned. So trying to get as many different opportunities for kids to recognize themselves or see themselves or identify with a character in the book as possible. Because you look at the statistics for children's books and they're predominantly white. The second most common character in children's books are animals, not even any other appearance. And I, I want to not be something that contributes to that. I want to be something a little bit different and a bit more inclusive. So that was an important thing for me, for sure. I noticed there were also some more subtle subliminal messages in some of the graphics. On R is for rent. Uh, there is a sign in the back, a picture uh, with Paula Pant's famous quote, uh, you can afford anything, but you can't afford everything. And then I also noticed that in S is for save on the marquee in the theater and back is announcing the Plutus Awards, which is, of course, the personal finance creator awards. You snuck some things in there. So when I was creating this book, I did it through Kickstarter. And I don't know how familiar everyone is. So I'm just going to give a quick background Kickstarter. Apologies for that. If you know what it is, Kickstarter is a crowdfunding platform. So you imagine like a GoFundMe, but Instead of it just being, let's raise funds for a particular person, we're going to try and sell an idea and create an idea together. So people who have an idea for a business or a product, a game, a book, um, a play, anything like that, you can go on a Kickstarter, tell people about the idea, and then let them buy it ahead of time. So you're pre-selling it to them. So I did a Kickstarter for this book. I had a couple of images to get started. I knew what the book was going to be about. I already had a first draft done. And I was able to pre-sell the book on Kickstarter and people can buy different levels, different tiers of rewards. So the, the lowest one they could do is just say, I want to see this book come into the world. I'm going to contribute to this project without any reward at all. And then there was an ebook, which was the cheapest reward tier you could buy. And then you got a single hardcover, a signed hardcover, two hardcovers. And then it built up to the highest one um, that I sold was for a class set of books. So someone was buying a book for themselves and they were donating 30 books to classrooms. And what I did was to get the campaign started, I approached people that I loved in the personal finance community. I liked their message. I've listened to their content or watched or read their content. And I said to them, look, I want you to be one of these high tier backers. And as you know, a reward, I guess, for that, or a thank you for that, I want to include an Easter egg in my book. And it's the Easter egg idea comes from video games where like, you've got this kind of subtle message inside of a game or a movie or a book that only some people will recognize because they know those brands already and everyone else will just kind of gloss over it. So those are my, I guess, early adopters who came in and said, yes, we really want to see this project come to life. And that was my way of thanking them for that.
We are talking to Rob Phelan. He is the author of M is for Money, which was created to help young children become confident and responsible money managers. It is available for pre-order right now and officially launches on November 13th. We're going to take a short break. I'm Doc G, and this is Earn and Invest. Here on Earn and Invest, we often talk about fintech, but specifically, which apps do you use that makes your money easier? Well, I like to send people to Unify Money. Unify Money covers the whole gamut of our financial needs, including savings with high-yield savings accounts, spending, including credit cards, as well as investing. A core part of our long-term financial security and resilience is building an investment portfolio. The earlier we start, the better, and the less we lose in fees, the more money we will make in the long run. Unify Money helps you create a personalized investment portfolio effortlessly and gives you the option to trade actively across both traditional equities as well as stocks, funds, alternative assets, cryptocurrencies, gold, silver coins and bars, you name it. They even have fractional investments in precious metals. Everything you can think of, you can find it at Unify Money. Check them out. Go to earnandinvest.com slash unify. That's earnandinvest.com slash U-N-I-F-I. Rob Phelan is a father, husband, and an advocate for personal finance education. His book, M is for Money, comes out November 13th. Rob, you wrote on Emma's for Money webpage, and I heard you talk about this earlier. My goal for this book is to help young people build positive relationships with money. You also talked about guilt and shame. Why was that so important in making this book? When I started my personal finance journey and started really diving into podcasts, blogs, books, I remember, I think it was Brene Brown was the first person who talked about the idea of shame and guilt around money. And I was like, it makes so much sense. Like people are a little bit embarrassed to talk about money. It's this taboo topic. Most of us have not made the most amazing decisions in the world in our twenties or early thirties. And it just ends up being this topic that nobody really feels very comfortable bringing up at a party or talking about with their friends. It's sort of this source of shame and guilt. And I don't want kids to feel that way. And that's how I feel when I teach high school as well is they're almost taken aback by how open I am about money and especially my own finances. Like they've never come across in some cases, an adult who is an open book when it comes to asking questions about money. And I want to, I want to encourage kids to think that way. So giving parents, caregivers, teachers, this opportunity to have a medium for talking about money was something that I wanted to achieve with this book. So the stash, the squirrel questions were one of the ways of doing that. So like if you ask the kid this question, they engage with you on the topic. Maybe you give your two cents on it too. Now you've started this idea that it's okay to talk about money. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to want to talk about money. So like, it's not like you're a horrible person if you want to earn money or you want to build wealth for the future or security or safety, or you want to give generously. And I think we have to break some of those stereotypes as well. That pe- The only people who think about money are like horrible people who are out to rule the world with their wealth. Did it occur to you as you were writing this that it would actually be the parents, educators, and caregivers who this would help deal with some of that shame embarrassment as opposed to just the children? Yeah, because it's the kids don't really have any shame or embarrassment yet around it unless they've already started having that mindset brought in. It's mostly us, the the adults who need the help there. But if we're going to change a generation, you've got to at some point break the wheel and start again. And this was hopefully going to be something that would help do that. It won't do it on its own, but it's that first step for kids where a parent, caregiver, teacher can introduce the topic in a safe way and let kids start at least building a positive relationship with money. One thing I thought is you're pretty thoughtful about the adults in the room who are going to be introducing this book. In fact, you even added a guide at the back of the book to help caregivers use the book. Tell me why you included that and and how it helps them. I saw examples of this in other books. Tiffany Alice has a wonderful book for kids, Happy Birthday, Molly Moore. And that was one of the, again, the first kid books I came across. I was like, this is a book written by someone who understands money and it's for kids. And I really liked it. My son loves the book. And in the back, she had this like tips for parents, like to bring up money conversations at home. I was like, I like this a lot. 
And I want to just change it now to also include teachers and caregivers because I can see this book ending up in schools. I can see grandparents keeping at home. I can see different community organizations potentially using this and giving talks around it. So I didn't want to just limit the conversation to parents because we know kids are influenced and around by so many other adults than just their parents. And in some cases, they don't have parents involved at all. So I want to make sure it was very inclusive in that way too. I see this book as the opening volley, maybe one of the first things kids are introduced to. Tell us what the next steps are. So parents, educators, caregivers, they're going to be getting this book. They're going to be reading it with their children. What happens next? How do they continue that education? That's a great question. So there are more books coming out now, which is great. So if your kid is showing an interest in reading and they love reading, they love books, then there are lots more books you can find and books that will age up with them. I would say like, as you start introducing this money vocabulary, now it's up to you to try and start bringing it into daily language. So as you're out and about, can you start pointing out the things like, oh, this is how much this thing costs. That kid is doing a lemonade stand. They're a kidpreneur. There's a dollar and you start pulling out cash and showing them all these things and bringing it into part of their lives. And we talked already about like getting down on the floor and playing with them, being a inclusive, like trying to include them in the money I guess, experiences on a day-to-day basis. And I think it's very easy as parents to be like, kiddo, you stay at home with other parent or babysitter, caregiver, whoever, I'm going to go do X, Y, Z to kind of care for the finances of the house. And they never get to see what's going on. It's the same thing when you go to work, like you're, you disappear for the day. You say you're going to work. Your kid has no idea what that means. They just know that you're gone. You come back again. But if you can kind of try and explain to them like, oh, I go to work to make money that allows us to do all these things that we've just talked about if you get the opportunity to show them what you do at work, I think that's even more um, powerful. Like my son sat on my lap a lot last year during COVID and got to see like, Hey, this is what uh, being a teacher is like kind of, but in a very odd way. And I I don't know, there's just so many opportunities for conversations, I think is what it comes down to and including them as much as possible. Doug and Carol had great examples in their book. So this was a how to raise your money savvy family for next generation, financial independence. And they were talking about like, they included Carol in more and more conversations as she got older. So the budget for the household, like if you're going to start having a kid who's at pointing at everything and saying they want it, if you want to avoid that uncomfortable conversation of saying no over and over and over again, the way to do that is to involve them in the planning process. And you say, okay, this is how much money we've got. It's got to go to rent or mortgage. It's got to go to these utility bills, the food. This is what's left over for our wants and saving and you know, I think we all really want to go on this vacation next year. So do you agree on that? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to put this money in there. We're going to do this experience, whatever it is. So that when a kid points to something and says they want it, you can be like, okay, you, know, you can want that. We didn't agree on this in our budget because we said we wanted to go on this vacation instead. Do you think this is more important than the vacation? And hopefully your kid is coming to this realization of, well, no, like I want to do the vacation later. And it's hard for them if it's in the future, like it, it's going to take time for them to get the idea of things in the long-term versus short-term future, immediate gratification versus delayed but we can build up those skills as we go. Yeah, you've brought up Doug and Carol's book, which is interesting because in some ways I feel like their book is how to bring up money savvy kids. Your book is what to start them with. <laughs> yeah, and I kind of feel like they married together a little bit, like the parent would be reading one, the kid would be reading the other at the same time. Yeah, yeah, that's certainly how I see it. Let, let's take a chance here to pivot. We've been talking about introducing these money ideas, these finance ideas to young kids. But also an important part of your story was how you actually got this book made. This is you are a first time child's author. Let's start with the basics. How long did it take you to write this book from start to finish? Because a lot of times we look at kids books and we, I think we wrongly feel there's not that many words in them (laughs) so that it's a fast process. But my bet is that it takes longer than people think. I think it does. And I think it can be a fast process. Like I think there are some children's books, authors who can churn these things out very quickly because they understand the process now and they're just, they're in that zone. This is what they do on a full-time basis. So yeah, word count wise, it's not that long. I think it's less than a thousand words um, if you string all the words of the book together. But every word has to be, because there's so few of them, every word has to be very thought out. It has to be very purposeful. You have to cut anything that is, potentially confusing. You have to really look at your language and make sure that it's something that is universally understood by children. The the words you're using are age appropriate and not going to be something that's outside of the vocabulary that's going to confuse the meaning of the message. So if I'm introducing a new money word, I can't also introduce five other new words in the same sentence, or they're going to totally lose track of what they're doing. 
the illustrations are such a big part of a children's book because that's what they're going to see first. That's the part that's really going to grab their attention, especially when they don't know how to read yet. And the parent is the one doing the reading. It's, you know, it's got to be very inviting. It's got to be very eye-catching, hold their attention. It's got to show enough in there that kids can feel like what the story is about. So like in my case, like I had to try and find ways to describe some action words that were a little bit hard, like the idea of give, like it's a verb, like how do you show that in a still picture? I think something like dollar is a little bit easier. Like you just have to include a picture of the dollar in the image somewhere, but some of them are a little bit harder than others. And that was the part that took the longest time, like writing the first draft, not super long. I think I started in January and I was probably done the first draft by March. And from there, it was kind of tweaking words, making, doing focus groups, seeing like what other people thought and testing with kids. But the illustration part, I started in April and we didn't finish the illustrations till August. So it was a lot of going back and forth with the illustrator, trying to convey the message that I was trying to get to parents, caregivers, and so on, and tweaking those finer details that you talked about to make sure that this was the complete picture. You just said a few interesting things. Let me start with the first. How long did it take you to find an illustrator and how did you? So the illustrator to find them wasn't terrible. So there are lots of wonderful face gr- Facebook groups out there for independent authors. So I'm an independent author for this book. I published with Chooseify Publishing for um, the Simple Startup when I did that. So this was a different adventure for me. And if you're an independent author and you're doing it on your own, that means you know you no publishing house that's helping you out. You're doing you're responsible for everything. I hired a independent author coach to help me out, which was wonderful. Her name was MK Williams, and she was fantastic at just kind of guiding me through this process because there is a lot to learn. And the illustrator part, I went into Facebook groups for children's book authors and illustrators. There's at least seven major ones with over 30,000 members in them. And I created a job post. And when you do that, you have to be very specific and detailed about what you want. And I said, you know, I'm looking for X, Y, Z send me a link to your portfolio if you feel like you fit those criteria. And we had over a hundred responses and we quickly whittled out the ones who didn't meet the criteria and then started looking through the ones that did, seeing could they represent different types of kids very well, different families, what was their price range like? So I was looking for someone who was going to fit and ended up going with this company, FX and Color Studio, who are based in India. And I was kind of, I like that. I was like, I'm, I'm not going to just restrict this to a U.S. company. I'm going to let this open up to the world. It's a multicultural um, book, ideally. So let's let's not restrict ourselves to just being in the U.S. And I love the work that they did. They were a reasonable price that wasn't the cheapest. It wasn't the most expensive. It was exactly where I needed to be. And I liked the way he spoke. He was like, yeah, I'm excited about this project. I want to be a part of it. He wanted to be kind of almost like a part owner in the process, which I really liked. You mentioned also the use of focus groups, which I think almost is an extra step. How did you decide on doing it? And once you did decide on that, how did you actually gather your focus group? I guess it was important for me to recognize that I am a high school personal finance teacher. I'm a certified financial educator, but I don't specialize in young kids. And I had to like make sure that I was addressing the needs of that population. And the only way to do that was to put it in front of other people. So I love focus groups. I think they're great. I invited... I think 10 people to be a part of this group who were either personal finance experts, they were elementary school teachers, preschool teachers, a couple of parents who you know love to read, bookstagram reviewer. And I said, you know, I'll buy you a Starbucks coffee and we'll just kind of get together and talk about this book. And they all took a look at their first draft and my like very crude illustrations that I was like, this is what I think it's going to look like. And they started giving me feedback on the words I was using, the way I was laying it out, how I was presenting it. And it was just really valuable to get all of their different perspectives before even approaching the illustrator say like, this is what I want the final product to look like. And then I did a second round where I asked them to you know, put the book in front of kids before I pushed the print button, just to make sure that it was actually what it was supposed to be. And what were the responses of the kids? Did anything surprise you? Oh, they were like the best proofreaders ever. Cause I had like A is for allowance. Like, what would you do with an allowance? And then later on, I think it was like M is for money. And it was like, what would you use money for? And the kid, like, it was very bluntly, was like, well, you just asked me the same question twice. Like, it's the same answer. And I was like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so <laughs> like, I, darn went it. <laughs> and, I went back and changed one of the questions. And that was very valuable. And again, kids are, they just see the world a little bit differently than we do. They have no hesitation to tell you what they see, which is great. There was no, like, trying to protect my feelings in any way, which is wonderful. And it was, it was valuable. And a lot of the kids were saying, like, I, I like this. The parents were saying, like, my kid... A, sat through the entire book, which is great. That's always a good start. They had answers to the stash questions, which the parents were kind of like surprised at. They're like, oh, they were, even though 
they didn't quite understand the topic fully before that page, they were able to give an answer based on their understanding of it. So like, I'll ask my son, like, what can, what would you buy with a dollar? And he'll, you know, usually throw out like a bear or a ball or something like that. I'm like, you don't quite get it, but you get the idea that you're going to have to use this money to buy something. And that was kind of the fun part is just seeing like how kids are responding to it. You also decided to go with Kickstarter to fund this project. Tell me why you did and how was the process? I did it because I did not have the money myself to pay for it all. So plain and simple. And when I talk to my kids in simple startups, so I do online uh, coaching courses where I coach kids through starting their first businesses or 10 to 18 year olds. One of the things I talk to them about is here's how we start a business for free. And I wanted to give an example to them. So that was one of the other motivations for doing this is I wanted to demonstrate, here's how you can start something for free. And one of the ways of doing that is to pre-sell your value. So you tell people what the business is or the idea is, you let them pay for it ahead of time. And then you use that money that you brought in to bring the business to life. And you don't ever actually put your own money on the line or into it. And the Kickstarter kind of solved two problems for me. It helped me to fund it first off, and it also gave me idea validation. So did people actually want this book in the first place? Because your your friends, your family, your spouse, they'll tell you it's the best idea in the world. Like, oh yeah, absolutely. I'd buy that. But until you ask people to pull out their wallet and pay for it, you don't really get true feedback as to whether it's a good idea or not. So Kickstarter, if you don't fund the projects, you have to set a funding goal of how much you want to raise to bring this project to life. If you don't meet the funding goal, nobody's credit cards get charged. Everyone walks away from the table without losing money. So up until that point, Kickstarter doesn't make anything. There's no fees or anything like that. It's just your time to make the page. And we met our Kickstarter goal of $6,000. We met that in the first 10 days. And then in the following 20 days, so it's a month long, we reached $13,700. So it was like more than doubled my goal. I was like, okay, people actually want this thing. So I'm going to move forward with this press print and start making this thing a real, a real deal. So that was the reason why I went Kickstarter. Tell me what was the average avatar of the person who was putting money towards the project? Some, I don't know. Some are anonymous. Um, I had a lot of the, I guess, personal finance community who were very interested in this. So followers of Choose a Fi, Stacking Benjamins, we did an interview on that. And I had a lot of um, people come in and buy after that. I would say, yeah, a lot of the personal finance community were very interested in this, in the Kickstarter part. So like, they're the ones who are willing to be the early adopters. They're like, yep, I am very interested in money myself. I want my kids to be interested in money too. Let's get in on this early and you know, let's back an idea before it's a real book. And since it has come out and it's on pre-order, now I'm seeing more kind of general population parents coming in, a lot of schools as well. So I've had a couple of bulk orders for schools, which I'm really excited about. So teachers saying like, I want to introduce this to my elementary school kids and they're buying class sets. I've had a community organization who is buying a class set and they're doing like a book club with kids in inner city, New York, which I think is so cool. So like they get the book sponsored, they give the kids the, the books to the kids. And then they kind of meet up together and do a book club sort of idea with it, which I'm really excited about. I think I'm going to speak remotely in that as well, which I'm excited for. And did I see that you're giving 10% of the proceeds to be donated to charities? And if so, which charities? Yes. So once the simple start, or not simple start, once MS for Money is profitable, which I'll have to come back for a funny story on that one. Once it is profitable, 10% of profits are going to go towards nonprofits who are furthering financial education in the US. So Choose a Five Foundation is a nonprofit that I'm very fond of because I've worked for them in the past. And that would be a place I would start. Next Gen Personal Finance, I love Jumpstart, Junior Achievement. And then some of these smaller organizations that are you know, trying to do personal finance programs, I would love to help support them as well. And it can be financially, it can be with books. I don't mind whichever they prefer, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited for that part. The reason that there's no profits yet though... <laughs> is, you know, unfortunately the first round of books came back and I thought they looked great. We proofread them for I don't know, 20, 30 times, like me and a couple other people and everything looked great. I was starting to send them out to my Kickstarter backers. And then I dropped one off at my local library. I was like, Hey, would you be interested in putting this up on the shelf? And she wrote me an email. I was like, Oh, I love this. It looks great. Cause he's being a great resource for kids, but we can't put a book on the shelf that has a spelling error. And no. I, I oh, was no. like, no, it's not, <laughs> it's not possible. This book only has like three, four, three or four hundred words and how is there a spelling error? But sure enough on the page, it's one of those, I guess, tricks of the human mind that we see the word that was supposed to be there as opposed to what's actually there. So the word P-A-Y, so pay 
at P A X. And I guess the letter X and Y are sort of similarly shaped. So like, yeah, the mind just reads over it, but this person caught it and thank goodness they did. Cause I hadn't pressed print on the mass production kind of thing yet. So I had to do a reprint of that early run. So there's now a collector's edition of the book out with a, a spelling error in it. If anyone wants to try and grab that, but I had it to could be worth, that could be worth more. Someday, someday it's going to be worth so much money, guys. <laughs> but yeah, for my Kickstarter backers, I had to go to them and say, look, I'm so sorry. I sent you a copy of the book that had a spelling error in it. That's not what you paid for. Please let me know if I can replace that book for you for free. And you know, several of them come back and said, yes, you know, I would love a replacement for it. So I think as a business owner, an author, it was important to stand up and own that mistake and replace the books. But yeah, that unfortunately put me in the red temporarily, but pre-sales are looking great. So I'm expecting to be back in the black very soon and being able to start giving that 10% profits to you know nonprofits that are close and dear to my heart. Yeah, I would expect you to be back in the black soon too, because I really feel like M is for money fills a space that hasn't been filled before. I think it is made for kids of that certain age. And as you said, it takes something that is filled with anxiety, guilt, shame, all sorts of things in adults, and it lays it out there for kids so they can have a healthy relationship with money, which I think is a very valuable tool and resource. I wanted to thank you for coming on the show and do what I do at the end of every episode by having you tell us what's up next in your life and where we can find you if we want to learn more. What comes next and where can we find you? All right. So next is the official launch of the book. So it's available for pre-order now. The book officially releases on November 13th of 2021, but you can go find it anywhere you know, major books are sold. So Amazon, Target, Barnes and Noble, bookshop.org, they're all carrying MS for Money as a pre-order at the moment. You can buy it in hardcover, softcover, ebook, or audiobook, which the audiobook was a really exciting one as well. We have like a, a whole story for that one, but we'll keep that for another day. Did you read it yourself? I did not. Oh, no way. We hired a voice artist, voice actor. Voice actor. Yeah. Yes. From Fiverr. And he did an amazing job. I love it. My son is obsessed with it. Like we'll listen to it in the car all the time. He prefers it to the actual book at the moment. <laughs> and then up next after that is the Simple Startup has its winter challenge starting. So the next crop of young entrepreneurs are going to learn how to start their first businesses, which I am always so excited for. I'm only doing it twice a year now. I kind of scaled it back to make room for other projects and to sort of I don't know. I want it to be a winter and a summer thing. So the winter challenge starts on January 12th. It runs till, until March 9th. And uh, you can find that information at the startup.com forward slash challenge. And is that the best way to find you at the simple startup.com or M is for money.com? Yeah, I'm like all over the place now. There's so many different things. M is for money book.com is where you can find information about the book. You can contact me. The simple startup.com is where you can find information about entrepreneurship for kids. I'm on all the major social medias, um, not on TikTok yet. I haven't gone there. Are you dancing on TikTok yet, Doc? No, I am no. not. And I have to admit, <laughs> you know, I, I'm 48 years old and I just think it's it's passed me up, I think. I don't know. I don't know. I think you pull it off. You know, like <laughs> lip syncing to song lyrics, like totally off. Like you could do it. I was about to say the last <laughs> thing people want to see is Doc G dancing around and pointing to the screen as oh, yes. important money concepts pop up. I would but... point to the screen and the bubble would pop up in the wrong space. So I'm like, I, I don't know. <laughs> But yeah, you can find me on Facebook, MS for Money Book. You can find me on Instagram, MS for Money Book. Twitter, it's Fi Educator, F I Educator. And I'm on LinkedIn as well, if anyone wants to connect with me there. All right. Well, this has been the Earn and Invest podcast. On behalf of myself, Doc G, I wanted to thank Rob Phelan. That's a wrap. Sweet. Excellent. So I thought the book was great. Um, and I think I think you're exactly right. I don't think that kind of book is out there uh, for that age group. And um, the I thought it was very well illustrative. I yeah, thought it was I, I, love I thought what it was it. Yeah. So the and I thought the wording was was excellent too. Like I think you really hammered it home, concise, straightforward. Um Clearly, you put a lot of care into it. Like I can, I'm looking at this, and this is not something that was just slapped together. This is no. something that there was a, a lot of thought. So, so I Thank thought you. you did a great job. And I certainly, I would hope, I, I would imagine that you will get hopefully some school systems. Really, depending on your marketing and PR, that you'll really get some school systems involved. Is MK doing some of that for you too, or who's doing it? 
Yeah, so MK is still like on the coaching side with me and helping me out with that. But my hope is to go to like local banks, credit unions, um, investing yeah. firms, anyone like who's financial when, and like get them when to kids sponsor start the their book. saving. Yeah, when kids start, you know, give one of those out when kids open a savings account. Yes. Um, Remember so those when they used that. to give out toasters? And so a lot of, I don't know, we have a local bank that still gives out stuff for kids, like when they deposit money. Um, I saw that too. Uh, there's a, a, it's a United First Bank and they have like a little pack for kids when they open their first savings account. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. Yeah, that'd be a great, great placement for the book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think once it's out on Amazon, start getting some reviews and positive feedback. And then I can say like, here's the validation. This is a good book. I think it might start snowballing a bit more then too. Yeah, and so definitely a different feeling than uh, the simple startup, right? So this is very you. You've done two very, very different books. Yeah, one was like a total like school resource workbook. Yeah, workbook. Yeah, yeah, and this one was very different, but a great experiment. It's like one of those sort of just let's try something new and see what happens. So are we going to see eventually the Rob Phelan philosophical money book like for adults (laughs) at some point? Because you haven't hit that genre yet. Oh, probably not. Those things are a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> it's like with a kid's book, I mean, you can have hundreds of kids books in a house and like, it's not too many, like with the, with the self-help adult books, I don't know, like you've read five, you've kind of read most of the, yeah, you've almost yeah. read them all. Haven't you? Yeah. Especially so if you're deep into it. If you haven't read anything, it's great. Right. Cause yeah. there's all these good personal finance books out there. But once you've read a few, it's like, okay, I kind of get the idea, et cetera. Yeah. Like everyone has like a slightly unique message. Like For sure. But it's almost like you can get that from their social media account versus like actually picking up their book, which is hard. Cause it's like, there's so many people I want to support. I'm like, I already know exactly what's in this book, which is hard versus like kids book. All you have to do is like create a tiny mini story and you've got a whole new thing. Yeah. Yeah. I was, um, I was worried because I interviewed Dan Sheeks for his book recently. Hmm. Um, but I knew immediately after looking at your book, I'm like, oh, these are totally different books, different genre, different, different group you're talking to completely different things. He's a great guy. Um, I'm excited for his book. I hope it's exactly what is needed for that age group. Cause I don't think that age group, has you know, as I was saying, yet. it's it's a hard age group, right? Cause you're teaching some of this, both of you are teaching this age group, yep. right? But it's a hard age group. Cause it's really hard to convince them that this matters. It's just, yeah, they're not there mentally. Cause um, that age aren't reading self-help books for the most part. Like yeah, you'll find the unicorn kids who have picked up rich dad, poor dad. And you're like, Oh, this is amazing. Great. But yeah, I would love to have his book on my shelf. Like if it's the right book for kids. I have to read it myself. It's sitting on my bookshelf at home. Um, but yeah, I would love to like have that as like the one to hand to kids when they show an interest and be like, here's a book. Yeah. Yeah. And his is, it's a hardcore kind of five book with a real estate bent. Um, mm-hmm. but for teenagers, yeah. um, have you read it? Yeah. So I interviewed him a few weeks back. I've just been holding it cause I'm holding it for his, his drop date. If you're okay, I probably will drop yours sooner. Cause I'm running out of I have a bunch of ones that are going later on. Um, you can go out at any point because it's available for pre-order. pre-order. We mentioned pre-order. Yeah. We mentioned the date. So if you need to drop it soon, I may drop it on the 28th, which is next Thursday, if you're okay. Yeah, that's fine. 